It's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, the president of our society, GSA, Hap McSween. Hap is Chancellor's professor, professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He holds degrees in chemistry from the Citadel and in geology from the University of Georgia and Harvard. Unlike most geologists, Hap's attention is drawn to rocks falling from the heavens rather than those already underfoot. He has published hundreds of scientific papers on the petrology of meteorites and their implications for understanding the formation and geologic evolution of planets. He also explores planets by spacecraft, currently as co-investigator for the Mars Exploration Rovers, the Mars Odyssey Orbiter, and the Dawn Asteroid Orbiter. He is the author of three popular books on planetary science, as well as widely used textbooks on geochemistry and cosmochemistry. His research has been recognized by the J. Lawrence Smith Medal of the National Academy of Sciences, the Leonard Medal of the Meteoritical Society, and the Whipple Award of the American Geophysical Union. He is a fellow of GSA, has been a member for 47 years, and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is the namesake for an asteroid. Hap's presidential lecture focuses on his lifelong interest in the planetary geosciences as, and is entitled Mapping the Planets, Geology Stakes Its Claim. Hap. I feel distinctly underdressed. <laughs> the inaugural GSA presidential address in 1899 ended this way. The world must advance or retrograde. It cannot stand still. J.J. Stevenson was referring to the world of science and more specifically to geology. As prescient as he was, the society's first president might not have imagined that geology would advance to other worlds. At that time, the only body besides the moon with features resolved through telescopes was Mars. And that planet famously was argued to have canals built by sentient be beings. In fact, the better part of a century of GSA history would lapse before the Planetary Geology Division was established in 1981. Planetary science, though, has had a surprisingly long presence in GSA publications. The GSA Bulletin featured what I consider to be its first planetary paper in 1921, its fourth year of, of existence. Other GSA publications have followed suit. The very first issue of Geology contained two planetary papers. GSA Today published its first planetary article during its first year and geosphere during its second year, and lithosphere during its third year. Planetary geology began, appropriately enough, with the geologic mapping of our nearest neighbor. Although cartography from telescopic observations of the moon had been conducted for more than three centuries, the first lunar geologic map of the region surrounding Copernicus Crater based on the stratigraphic principles so useful in terrestrial geology, appeared in a landmark study by Shoemaker in 1962. Later that same year, Shoemaker and Hackman divided the lunar time scale into periods delineated by cataclysmic impacts, with major formations defined as the ejecta blankets of these impact craters. That was a new twist on time and rock units, but it was respectful of the principle of linking rocks and time and has worked well for heavily cratered planets. Lunar geologic units, as in terrestrial maps, were integrated into a stratigraphic column and were dated first with relative ages determined from crater density measurements. Shoemaker recognized the value that geologic maps would have in selecting landing sites for the Apollo program and in extrapolating data from these few sites to the rest of the moon. By 1966, 28 lunar quadrangle maps had been produced from telescopic imagery. 
Subsequent lunar geologic maps and cross sections have been based on observations at higher spatial resolution from orbiting spacecraft. Similar to stratigraphic columns on the Earth, which initially had only relative ages until radioactive isotope dating techniques were developed, lunar stratigraphy was relative until crater densities could be calibrated with radiometric ages from volcanic or shock melted rocks returned by Apollo astronauts. From that beginning, geoscientists have moved forward with the audacious goal of mapping the entire solar system. Interestingly, geologic mapping of the planets has moved in an opposite direction from mapping on the Earth. Local maps of our own planet are pieced together to produce regional and eventually global maps. On the other hand, planetary explorers have had a global perspective from the outset, and their map progress downward to regional and local scales as spatial resolution improves. Geologic mapping of the planets nowadays still depends on imagery, but has been augmented by the application of remote sensing tools. The identification of minerals from their visible near-infrared and thermal infrared spectra provides a means of mapping compositional units on the Moon, Mars, and Mercury. Spectroscopy can often identify only a few minerals with diagnostic absorption or emission features, and then only if they are sufficiently abundant. But adding any mineralogic information to maps allows much more rigorous interpretation. Even from orbital at altitudes, the spatial resolution of spectral maps can be as small as a few tens of meters, although coarser resolutions are more common. For example, the CRISM spectrometer on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has distinguished and mapped concentrations of olivine and phyllosilicates. Orbital tools for geochemical analysis are also available. Gamma ray and neutron spectroscopy measures only a handful of elements at relatively coarse spatial resolution, but any chemical abundances are useful in distinguishing and interpreting geologic units. A prime example shown here is a global map of compositional terrains on the moon based only on iron and thorium abundances obtained by the orbiting lunar prospector. Gamma ray spectra are especially sensitive to these two elements and their concentrations vary greatly in different lunar lithologies. Other planetary bodies present different challenges. The surfaces of Venus and Titan, a moon of Saturn, are obscured by thick clouds. However, they have been imaged using radar, allowing the mapping of geologic units based on their topography and radar reflectivity. Mapping is not restricted only to large planets. Geologic maps have been compiled for all the satellites imaged by orbiting or flyby spacecraft. Moons of the giant planets show remarkably complex geologic units, comprised of jumbled blocks of icy crust, as on Europa, cross-cutting tectonic features and superposed impact ejecta, as on Ganymede, erupting volcanoes with associated pyroclastic deposits of compositionally exotic materials, as on Io, and lakes of liquid methane, as on Titan. Even smaller bodies, asteroids and comet nuclei, have been mapped where spacecraft imagery is available. The most recent example is this geologic map of asteroid Vesta, assembled from images and spectra obtained by the Dawn orbiter. Once a planetary body has been mapped from orbit, the next logical step is landing on its surface. The recent operation of mechanical rovers on Mars has allowed high resolution geologic mapping at scales with which field geologists can readily identify. The traverse maps made by Mars rovers resemble those compiled from observations of the Apollo astronauts on the moon, but rovers have extended their traverses much farther. Images and remote sensing data from Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity 
provide the basis for surface outcrop maps. The example shown here is Spirit's 7.7 kilometer six-year traverse map through the Columbia Hills and Gusef Crater with accompanying images of a few of the rocks encountered. Identifications of rock types analyzed by the rover have been extended further afield using spectrometers that can see for tens of meters, making the traverse map more representative. Mars surface mapping has also been supplemented with detailed stratigraphic context from the mapped and analyzed walls of impact craters, such as the Burns Formation section in Endurance Crater an analyzed by the Opportunity Rover and illustrated here. Spectroscopic analyses of chemistry and mineralogy and spatial context and textural analyses from panoramic and even microscopic imagers of the bedded rocks encountered provide sufficient information to make detailed interpretations of geologic processes and histories. These rovers have become virtual field geologists, allowing their science teams to project human observational and mapping skills onto the surface of Mars. The rovers have become so anthropomorphic that Sojourner, the first primitive rover on the Mars Pathfinder mission, was named a GSA Honorary Fellow in 1997. And Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity have refined the melding of humans, machines, and instruments to the point where planetary geologic mapping can arguably be done as well or better, albeit more slowly, by rovers than by astronauts. The return of lunar samples to Earth and the identification of meteorites from the Moon, Mars, and asteroid Vesta have also provided valuable ground truth for spacecraft remote sensing and better geologic interpretations of these data. For example, lithologic interpretation of lunar compositional terrains from the thorium and iron abundances, which I showed you in a previous slide, required comparison with laboratory measurements of those elements in returned Apollo rocks. Interpretation of the unexpected discovery of hydrogen in asteroid Vesta's surface regolith using neutron absorption measurements by the Dawn spacecraft was made possible because some meteorite breaches from Vesta contain water-bearing chondrite clasts. Comparison of laboratory geochemical analyses of geologically young Martian basaltic meteorites with rover and orbiter analyses of older volcanic rocks on the ground have provided new insights into the evolution of Martian magmatism through time. Although the specific locations from which meteorites were extracted from their parent bodies is not known, the ability to perform petrologic and geochemical analyses on rocks in the laboratory, not to mention the geochronology provided by analyses of radiogenic isotopes, strengthens the characterizations of map geologic units and the interpretations of geologic history. Geologic exploration of planetary bodies, along with the analysis of extraterrestrial samples, has demonstrated that the tried and true tools and methods of geology can be exported to other worlds. Like Earth, our planetary neighbors are geologic experiments conducted at a grand scale but carried out with different starting compositions and under different physical conditions. From the study of other bodies, we can test the generality of the geologic processes we have worked so hard to understand on our own planet. And in some cases, we gain fundamentally new insights. Let me give you a few examples. The early terrestrial planets, including the Earth, had magma oceans formed by heat from the decay of short-lived radionuclides and collisions with other bodies. Global scale melting had profound implications for the differentiation into cores, mantles, and crusts, and for the geochemical partitioning of elements required by modern industries that fuel the world's economies. Plate tectonics dominates terrestrial geology, 
but Earth's moving plates are unique among solar system bodies. One plate planets lose their internal heat in novel ways, and stagnant lid tectonics allows a bewildering array of geologic structures. Magmatism on Earth occurs mostly at plate boundaries, so melting mechanisms on other planets must be different. Basalts, albeit with distinctive compositions, are ubiquitous on all rocky bodies, but the pathways and extents of magma evolution differ, making granitic rocks virtually unrepresented outside our own planet. Impact cratering is the most significant geomorphic process on other planets and must have been on the early Earth as well. Large impacts have had disastrous consequences for life and unraveling this history has prompted the realization that we modern humans still live in the fast lane. Among the terrestrial planets, only the lithospheres of Earth and Mars have interacted with the hydrosphere. Other planetary surfaces are covered by impact comminuted regolith. And finally, reactive, or sorry, active or past sedimentary processes, once thought to be unique to Earth, are now known on Mars, which hosts both clastic rocks and evaporites, and on Titan, where fluids other than water produce and distribute sediments. The Earth is a planet too, and terrestrial processes at planetary scale can sometimes be better visualized or monitored from orbit. As an aside, it is worth mentioning that all of geology benefits from the interest that the public displays for planetary exploration, where the application of geologic principles is played out for all to see on a very large stage. It helps recruit the next generation of Earth scientists and provides new, new data sets for our own planet. The reconnaissance phase of solar system exploration is well along, but geologic understanding of most planets has only scratched the surface. Science by spacecraft is complex and expensive, and large multidisciplinary, often international teams of scientists and engineers have to work together seamlessly. Mission operations can last for decades, requiring several generations of investigators. This can be a new experience for geoscientists used to working in isolation and on projects of limited duration. Understandably, an important goal for planetary exploration is the search for extra extraterrestrial life. Efforts so far have focused on recognizing paleo environments that might have been conducive to organisms. The methods used by terrestrial paleontologists to study the distribution and evolution of organisms have not yet found application on other worlds. But life signals, especially of primitive life forms far removed from us in time, may be more readily recognized by geochemistry or biomarkers than in physical forms. Robotic exp explorers increasingly carry instruments capable of identifying the organic or isotopic tracers for life, while at the same time examining rocks for microscopic indications of fossilized material. And what are the newly recognized additions to the solar system's retinue of planets now being found in the frigid regions beyond Pluto? And the bonanza of extrasolar planets 1,800 at last count, that have been discovered orbiting other stars. At present, any information about these bodies is extremely limited, but as more data accrue, geologic reasoning will be needed for meaningful interpretation. This is an opportunistic time for geoscientists. Astronomy has basically abdicated much of the solar system to geology. Planets and smaller bodies are no longer astronomical points of light, but increasingly recognized as worlds shaped by more or less familiar geologic processes. This shift of a substantial quantity of scientific real estate has literally redefined the reach of our discipline. Geology has staked its claim on the planets and must play the central role in exploring this frontier. 
Thank you very much.